Almost everyone in the United States at one time or another has traveled at least a stretch of old Route 66. It's um, the road where the people from Oklahoma went to California. It's a part of American history. Just the name conjures up images of going somewhere. To me, it's going back in, and back in time, seeing things that I grew up with. So let's travel this blue highway all the way from Chicago to Santa Monica. Hello. And welcome to Blue Highways TV, Traveling Route 66. We're exploring perhaps the best known of America's Blue Highways, Route 66, a mother road. Over the years, my wife Suzanne and I have come to know and love the old highway from Chicago all the way to Los Angeles. We've had the pleasure of exploring the special towns and quaint attractions that hug her shoulders, and they never disappoint. Amarillo in the West Texas Panhandle has its own share of oddities as we continue our journey west. It's time to hit the road once again, this time heading through downtown Amarillo. The city itself was laid out in 1887 and was named Amarillo, the Spanish word for yellow, because so many of the homes here were painted that color. We made our first trip together on Route 66, actually from St. Louis to Amarillo in the late 60s. I can remember staying in Amarillo in a hotel on the old strip on Amarillo Boulevard, as a matter of fact. Um, and we, we were on, on our way from St. Louis to El Paso, Texas. And we began to talk about that, making that journey, that definitive journey down Route 66 in the late 80s to, to really photograph it and see what the real state of affairs was and to talk to the people. That was the main thing, talk to the people. Put together a, a scrapbook, a love letter of our own for Route 66. As you follow the interstate west past the city limit signs, there stands a bizarre pop art monument to the mother road. It's one no traveler should miss. Well, let's see here. I'm trying to figure out why anybody with a reasonably sound and sane mind would cross an old wheat field where a lot of cows tend to jungle up and mess around to come out here in the middle of nowhere on the edge of Amarillo. What could possibly lure all of us out here? Hmm. It could be 10 cars, nose down, right in that Texas turf. Stanley Marsh's Cadillac Ranch. That's what it is. So this is what it takes to get people out on the western edge of Amarillo, Texas, these 10 Cadillac automobiles. Models from the late 40s through the mid 60s, through that great heyday of Route 66. And Stanley Marsh III put them here so they can not just capture tumbleweeds blowing across this wheat field around the cattle, but so that people from the interstate and from beyond over on old Amarillo Boulevard, AKA the Mother Road, Route 66, would come over here and go through that break in the fence and come down that dirt path and pay homage to the ear of the, of the great Detroit sled, of the big car, of the wide open spaces. And I can't tell you how many people have stopped here. Some of them scratching their heads, not knowing why, but they come here anyway and they leave their generation of graffiti, their initials tattooed in those old cars. And what I've been enjoying doing is we come by here um, at various times, different seasons, different years, is to photograph some of the messages up close. Pink Floyd messages from this summer. Uh, people signing it and telling when they were here and why they were here and reminiscing. So I'm beginning to, just as there are individual Cadillacs, I'm beginning to find some individuality each time we come after Stanley has repainted them.
Stanley Marsh planted his caddies in the Texas Panhandle, a truly remarkable place that is also known as the Llano Escantado, or Stake Plains. This area, stretching into New Mexico, is so flat, and there are so few landmarks that early travelers had to drive stakes into the ground to mark their trails. West Texas can be an empty land, or it can be just as full as a, as a tick hanging off a longhorn in the middle of the summer. It just depends on how you perceive it and look at it and take it in. A lot of people drive through West Texas and they think it's desolate and barren, just like the Mojave. But those of us who get out on Route 66, where the road goes through the ecology of the land and you're not separated like you are on the interstate with those great banks, we know that there's life not only in that great Mojave Desert and the other southwestern climes, but here in this supposedly barren Texas panhandle. There's winter wheat percolating under that ground right now. There are whole legions of longhorns and heifers and angus feeding all over these lots. There are the ghosts of so many cowboys and Comanches and pioneer settlers and native people and all kinds of folks who have traversed this land when there was no path at all and those who made the path and then those who chiseled out that Route 66 for us. There's a lot of life out here. There's a lot of legend. You'll find that it's alive and well and kicking. There's a lot of life in the Texas Panhandle. A lot to be seen and shared. There are also ghosts and places that ghosts prefer to inhabit. You know, a lot of people like to come here to Glen Rio because this is a ghost town in the making. This is one Route 66 town that hasn't quite made it. There are more dogs here now than human beings. Uh, all the businesses are closed, the curio shops, the gas stations, the cafe that used to serve so many travelers. But somehow it's, it's a bittersweet feeling in Glen Rio. We need a little bit of this ghost road as well. So this alignment's kind of nice to uh, remember the way it used to be, the way it was. This is the place right back here where you can stand with one foot in Texas and the other foot in New Mexico, right here on Route 66. And so it's still good for that. It's good to, to have a, a picture made and, and maybe just stop and listen to the water dripping in the background of the old tank. And in August, you can hear the song of those locusts from the Chinese elms. It's not bad to have a little bit of sadness, too, on your journey. Makes you stop and think. Blue highways are those once busy arteries that were left behind when America began building the interstates. There's no better example of a blue highway than out on the Texas-New Mexico border near the once thriving town of Glen Rio. There, Route 66 has remained no more than a memory of times past. We leave Glen Rio and motor west into New Mexico along the old highway. Five states are behind us now, and three more are ahead as we follow the mother road to California. Here in the land of enchantment, Route 66 has changed very little in the years since Steinbeck's Jode family passed by. Between the Texas border and the Pecos River, lies a section of New Mexico that once was home to large buffalo herds and became the hunting ground of Comanche warriors. It was a land roamed by Spanish conquistadors, American settlers, gunfighters, and later cattlemen. At many points along this route, you can still search out relics from the Dust Bowl days. For many, the interstate that replaced Route 66 out here was heaven sent. They remember the old road between the Texas line and Tucumcari as dangerous. It was narrow, pocked with holes, and generally not well maintained. Many people died on this stretch of the mother road. It was said that there was only a few inches in a cigarette paper between you and death on Route 66. 
Needless to say, travelers along this road were glad when they made it to the first big town in New Mexico, Tucumcari. Tucumcari tonight. That's what those big red and yellow billboards still say. 2,000 rooms. Tucumcari, New Mexico, has always been one of Route 66 best place to jungle up for the night, to, to slip in here and get a cheeseburger platter or get your first taste of New Mexican cuisine and, and certainly to get a room. What a great spot, 2,000 rooms going and blowing in, in Tucumcari, New Mexico. And we're right here at, at a national treasure in more ways than one. This is the Blue Swallow Motel. For more years than I can remember, the Blue Swallow's been here. This pink adobe building with the little cottages trimmed in blue paint and with the neon blue swallows. This is Route 66 night light. It's a Lorelei that still lures truckers and tourists off the highway, off the interstate, back to the mother road. And it's owned and operated by a real angel of the road, Lillian Redman. This was one of the leading motels because it was out here on the highway. And uh, the celebrities like to come here. Route 66 is coming back. We've gone just as far and as fast as we can go. And we like all that high-tech, fast travel. But they've gone so fast, they're going to have to slow down. So Route 66 is their alternate. They get off the highway, the interstate, they relax a little bit, and they get down on Route 66 and look at the history. They enjoy it. You'd be surprised. Once Route 66 road warriors get a good night's sleep in one of Tucumcari's 2,000 motel rooms, they go back to the pavement once again, towards Santa Rosa. During the time of the Great Dust Bowl migration, the old highway crossed the Pecos River near Santa Rosa, where, when 66 was first created, the route then turned north and headed up into the New Mexico high country, into the ancient state capital. Here we are in Santa Fe, New Mexico, the city of holy faith. Here in the, the land of enchantment, the land of poco tiempo, little time. What an extra special place this is. And for many years, this was a Route 66 town. There's an alignment of the old highway running not far from here. Because it, well into the late 30s, Route 66 actually crept up towards the mountains, towards the Sangre de Cristos, visited Santa Fe, and then went to Albuquerque. After that, it made a beeline from Santa Rosa right down into the Duke City, into the biggest city in New Mexico. So Route 66ers still count Santa Fe as one of theirs. In order to preserve these pockets of Mother Road lore and culture, I write about Route 66, while Suzanne captures the essence of the Mother Road with her camera. Photographing Route 66 is a challenge because a lot of what is most beguiling to me as a photographer is in a state of ruin, you might say. The older buildings, the faded signs. The highway is not dead and that it's not gone, that there's a lot out there, that it's alive and, and uh, full of adventure. come out here and discover it. By 1937, 
Route 66 had bypassed Santa Fe altogether, saving travelers as much as four hours between Santa Rosa and Albuquerque. That stretch eventually became Interstate 40 as it carried motorists past Moriarty, Edgewood, Barton, and Tierras before dropping down into Albuquerque. The Duke City has always been an important trading center that dates back to 1706 when the Spanish came north from old Mexico along the Chihuahua Trail. Just jump off 66 as it passes near the old town district and you'll see for yourselves remnants from the past. Albuquerque, New Mexico is one of the large cities along Route 66. And even though the heart and soul of the mother road is in the small towns and hamlets and villages along the way, these big cities are still important. Much of Route 66 cuts through the sacred Indian lands of the Apache, Navajo, and Yavapai as it winds its way west from the Duke City of Albuquerque through the high desert of New Mexico. Here, unlike the interstate, the Blue Highway honors the land as it crosses the Laguna Reservation. From Albuquerque, the old road crosses the Rio Grande, heads west up Nine Mile Hill, then crosses a vast and varied land colored blood red, jet black, purple, and brown. Ahead is the valley of the Rio Puerco, carved by a stream that rises out of the Hickoria Apache lands and flows south into the Rio Grande. At the Rio Puerco crossing, the old road traverses a steel bridge, then continues west near Correo and into the Laguna Indian Reservation. Route 66 is at its very best at this point. Thanks to the builders, the roadway honors the land and adjusts to the terrain, skirting around mesas and ruins. It did not chisel into buttes and mountains or interrupt entire cultures like the interstate has done. The mother road crosses the San Jose River and curves into Laguna, an Indian pueblo dominated by a distinctive mission church. Yes, Brown lived in Laguna while the interstate was being built. He's still there today. It's not really progress, but you know, we there's a lot of stuff, you know, that we that we really, you know, that we had that we lost too, you know, like on the freeways and all that, you know, we got we got a lot of spiritual, you know, places and all that too. That's I mean we, we lost that too. West, the road takes travelers to Budville, Cubero, San Fidel, McCarty's, and Grants. More small towns beckon, and then there's the Continental Divide, the highest point on Route 66, 7,275 feet above sea level. In no time, road warriors will make the Arizona state line. But there is still a romp through the rest of New Mexico, and the last town, Gallup. Gallup is a railroad town and one of the great Indian trading centers of the Southwest. Route 66 was built right through the heart of Gallup, a town that has always had an affair with railroad buffs, highway voyagers, and neon. Then it's time for a good night's sleep in the Indian capital of the United States. And the promise of Arizona and another state to explore is 26 miles to the west. 
When John Steinbeck's Jode family made their trip down 66, the highway through Arizona wasn't even paved yet, and the entire route wouldn't be until the late 1930s. At that time, plenty of surprises met the Okies as they ventured west. Where are you going? California. How long you plan to be in Arizona? No longer than to get across. Got any plants? No, no plants. Okay, go ahead, but keep moving. We aim to. There was still an inspection station near the border, but the rude inspectors who greeted the Oaks are gone. Nowadays, gas stations and curio shops line the interstate at Lupton, where red sandstone cliffs skirt the border with New Mexico. Arizona is one Route 66 state loaded with tourist attractions. From the border, the old highway climbs west toward the towns of Holbrook and Winslow, and between the two, there is the famous Jackrabbit Training Post near Joseph City. Halfway between Winslow and Flagstaff, you can see traces of the old mother road. This is Two Guns, where old 66 once ran over an unusual bridge that spanned the infamous Diablo Canyon. Here there was a zoo, where caged mountain lions and other wild critters were displayed for awestruck tourists. The animals are gone, but not the visitors, who still stop to pay homage to the old road. On the way west to Flagstaff, you'll pass Twin Arrows, a trading post and truck stop with the look and feel of the old wayside businesses. Soon the desert gives way to pine forests as the pavement follows closely to the Santa Fe Railroad tracks. The highway climbs through the Coconino National Forest, not forgetting tiny Winona, the last name on the map before travelers enter the unofficial capital of northern Arizona, Flagstaff. After leaving Flagstaff, the highway moves through the snow-covered pines of the Kayabab National Forest on its way to the town of Williams at the foot of 9,264-foot Bill Williams Mountain and named for the colorful trapper who first explored the region in the 1830s. It was here in Williams that the last section of U.S. Highway 66 was replaced by the interstate. On October 13, 1984, Williams was given the dubious distinction of being the last town on the old highway to be bypassed. In 1984, when Williams was bypassed by the interstate, many people felt that would spell the end to their city. Not so. In the years since, Williams has earned its name as Gateway to the Grand Canyon. On the next Blue Highways, we'll find out why as we step aboard the Grand Canyon Railroad for a trip to one of the great natural wonders of the world. Until next time, I'm Michael Wallace. Travel well.